I'm Christopher Freeman, owner of Beautiful Hair for You. I'm Marcellus Womack, and I am uh, owner of marketing and PR consultant of Imperfect Marketing Solutions. Well, thank you guys for joining us at Financial Juneteenth University. You guys have a great story. Um, I'm excited to hop into this thing. And you guys have very different, came from different, very different walks of life. You got your education at FAMU University. You got your education in federal prison. Uh, both of you guys are here in the entrepreneurial world making names for yourself. So um, thank you for joining us at Financial Juneteenth, and let's hop into it. So, Brother Chris. Please tell the people about your hair care empire that you built. Well, basically, you know, I sell hair extensions that I import, and now I got into product um, manufacturing where I work with lab, a laboratory, and we're developing more products for to keep it to where, you know, when you come to my store, you won't have to go nowhere else. Self-sufficient unit, you know, to go against the institution that the Koreans and the, um, the Arabs created you know, we where you have to follow this brand or product and you need to, you know, keep going to that. You don't have to do that here. Wow. Wow. And how many stores do you have? Six. Six stores. Six. Wow. Yeah. Six, and cities. six stores, six cities. And how many states? Three states. Wow. And how much did you guys gross last year? Uh, two million. Two million. How much did you net? A million. Okay. So you netted a million plus dollars, and as I said earlier, you have a quite the checkered past, some might say. Yeah, I've been to prison, uh, federal prison, mm -hmm. uh, for drug uh, conspiracy. Okay. How much time did you do? I did a total of eight years. Wow. Wow. And you came out and you just to totally changed around your whole life. Yeah, I, like I got baptized. <laughs> <laughs> and... um. In your book, if you could hold that up for us, Marcellus, um, I believe you talk about what's it called? Black dope black boy to black boy to rich black man, and it's a guide to channeling a hustler's ambition to the development of an empowered and successful man like Christopher Freeman. That's it. That's it. So, so brother Marcellus, so how did how did this book come about? And please tell the people about your background. Not quite as checkered, but have different checks on it. <laughs> Tell people yeah. about yourself. I'm from uh, the south side of Chicago where you see headlines daily, and I grew up in that environment. Uh, um, but luckily for me, I had uh, parents in my life that kind of guided me and kept me active in sports and put me in, in, uh, in good schools, public schools, but some of the better ones that they could access. And from there, I went to uh, Florida A&M, uh, graduated out of the undergrad slash grad program for the MBA. Wow. And... Uh, Afterwards, started a marketing company and met Chris because when I moved to Jacksonville, uh, there was a homegirl. She told me this guy got the most fire hair. He's selling it out his trunk. And I've been working with other beauty supply owners, and they were all non-blacks. Mm. And that was just a cringing, you know, I grew up, you know, Chicago, Harold Washington, first mayor, you know, black mayor of Chicago, and uh, Operation Push, and, you know, Barack Obama was there, and Louis Farrakhan. So... I grew up in, in understanding just the importance of black unity and black empowerment and black economics. Mm -hmm. And when I heard this, I said, wow. And when she told me that he used to be a dope boy and, you know, he was making a whole bunch of money out of there, but he came out of prison. I said, this guy seems like he's on the verge of capturing everything that I felt in my heart a dope boy could be. Because I've, I've seen him. They've been some of my closest friends that have gone to prison have been killed. You know, I've seen that. And I, the only difference between them and me is I had some parents that told me, you got to get in when the street lights are on. Or you gonna, I'm going to pay for you to play some basketball at the YMCA when they had to play, you know, on the streets, you know, 24-7. So those are the only differences. And when I ran across someone who was using those skill sets that I knew so many young black males possess uh, the charisma, the, the entrepreneurial skills, the, the people skills, the motivation, uh, just misguided. When I saw him doing this, I said, wow, I'm going to be on the radar for him. And more and more, I would hear so much until it got to the point where every beauty supply owner that I knew knew about Chris and was asking me about him and because he was taking up so much of their market share. And he ended up, you know, pretty much taking over this Jacksonville market and so many other ones. And at a particular point, uh, me and Chris met. We went to a Starbucks, and uh, the rest is history. We, we, I set out a marketing campaign. Uh, I said, man, this is going to work. This is a huge opportunity. And 
of everybody in the city, you the one that I want to partner up to do it with. He said, man, I'm with it. It was even a, a music jingle that went along with it. I said, I'm going to get a girl that sing way better than me, but it goes something like this. And yeah. uh, to this day, women around Jacksonville uh, and other markets are singing a beautiful hair for you jingle. Even the little kids. <laughs> even the little kids are singing it. I'm yeah, the little kids know it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but I, I'll just mention this, Andre. For those who've watched Boys in the Hood, something that really resonated with me all of the time, I felt like I was more of the Cuba Gooden type. Okay. You know, I had parents in my life, a father that was, you know, dropping gems. And I felt that Ice Cube's role, a doughboy, was a lot of my homeboys. And if you watch that movie, yeah. they're real cool. They never have any conflicts with each other. They're really cool. And if you notice, Doughboy is one of the smarter characters. He's yeah. dropping knowledge on philosophy and religion. He's the one that's on the lookout. He can tell he's got the instincts to know when something's about to happen. Something's going on. They're probably going to go after Ricky or put the dude on the, in the wheelchair up. He had the instincts and he had a lot of other things. And Cuba Gooden Jr. or Ice Cube, either one of them could have become Furious Styles. Like Furious Styles could have went one way or the other. Yeah. Um, and it's just, just a, a difference in, in the environment and, and reprogramming your mind uh, that makes you an empowered, successful man versus one that gets caught up in the system. It, it, it's so, so it's true. been a pleasure reaching Chris because he, he experienced the street life, but reprogrammed his mind. He'll tell you about his experiences in doing so, so that he used every skill to to make him a, a, a dope boy that was making over $50,000 a month profit, you know, using those same skills to be able to transition legitimately into the business world, and nobody can stop him. Nobody can stop him. So he was making 50, you, you, you get 50K a month in the streets, big brother? Yeah. 50K a month in the streets. Yeah. Wow. That's profit. That's yeah, not, that's profit. And that was profit. And that was profit. That's flipping them. Man, you know, um, uh, I think flipping you have bricks. Some, flipping <laughs> bricks. So I think you have somewhere in your book, which you guys co authored, by the way, correct? Yes. Which you guys co authored. Um, that most drug dealers aren't as successful as you. Most aren't even as close. What's the average drug dealer salary? Minimum wage or below. Minimum wage or below. The average drug dealer makes less. So you can make more money or the same money working at Burger King, Wendy's, or Mickey D's. If you were in California, you'd probably make more money than you would because I think they pay Burger King workers and McDonald's $15 an hour. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> so for any of my brothers or sisters even watching this, Selling drugs, it's not even profitable for most people. They, they just say they just think it's easy, you know, because they don't have to report mm -hmm. to the, you know, to work. But I mean, it's you're not really making any money. Wow. So, what got you? How did you get involved in the street life and underworld? What brought you there? In the the streets, mm -hmm. my environment, watching people around me do stuff, you know, seeing people driving nice cars and you know my cousin them they was out there in the streets you know on the and he was a minimum wage worker too at that time i mean he was he just had a couple rocks he'll go out there and sell and that's how i ended up getting into it he gave me something to hold for him and i went my grown behind down there to the apartments uh down the street canterbury court and i hadn't seen what they was doing so i you know stood out there like everybody else and the lady came to me, and I she said she what she wanted, and I sold her what what I seen them sell to her. Wow! And I got hooked on it. Once I seen how quick you could turn the money, I'm like, oh my god! And the power behind that, Andre, <laughs> I just want to give you a, a drop back, even leading into that story that you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. But Chris, in sixth grade, Chris actually bought a bunch of candy wholesale, and he put together a crew to sell it in sixth grade mm -hmm. with his friends. But at the school, he not only had that, bought the candy for him, he bought walkie-talkies so they could communicate. So if they cut class, <laughs> and Principal yeah. James is coming down the stairs, like, well, Principal Cold, Cold Red, Principal James, uh, you know, uh, Shanika wants the sour apple, you know, blow pops, you know, on the second floor. But he had that ingenuity, he had that, that business entrepreneurial spirit to do that. And nobody in the school system could recognize that and say, well, you know what, maybe he needs to um, run our, our school instead of us selling these, you know, these chocolate bars for a dollar and, you know, making a little off of it. Maybe he can help run some sort of candy store for us. Like nobody saw that insight yeah. at a younger age. Now, what that turned into was at 14, he talked about that experience after he dropped out of school and he saw his cousin made had him hold something. He went to a marketplace and he was so intrigued, like, Guys who sell drugs, it's not just they just want to 
make women 90 pound fiends and you know have people stealing tv sets to do all types of obnoxious stuff like there's an enterprising spirit there's a capitalism spirit behind that so that was his only outlet to making money when he did that he was standing there for about a minute or less a woman came to him said are you holding gave him 20 dollars. he went back cousin was like man where's my rock at he's like i sold it he said give me my money give me my ten dollars yeah, and I Chris, gave him the ten dollars. Chris said, "Yo, she gave me twenty, <laughs> so he automatically understood profit. Like, I get this dude ten, I keep ten, and so what is he gonna say after that? He said, give me another one.' Yeah, I need some more. <laughs> and kept, give me some more. And, and you kept it going. What made you stop? Prison. Mm. Well, the first bid or the second bid? Really, the second bid because." They sent me to that out there in California, mm -hmm. and I went to a USP. I started at a U for something that I, what I did when I was uh, 13. I got a strong arm robbery charge, and it's it looks like a violent charge on your jacket to the federal defense. They're not gonna send you to a country club, you know, with these people who done frauded Wall Street, you know, with a violent. Uh, they look at it as you have a potential to get violent. You know, even with the strong arm robbery, we were supposed, me and my cousin got in a fight with a dude. My cousin snatched his chain off. So it was really a fight. But then my cousin just snatched the man's chain and took the chain. So we got charged with strong arm robbery and battery. And I mean, when 13. the feds look, yeah, 13. And the feds look at your whole background to classify you what prison to put you in. And I scored out, not the first time, but the second time. The region saw fit to put me in a penitentiary with a 40 foot wall where they sent all the game bangers and uh, the Mexican mafia and the Texas syndicate, the Aryan Brotherhood and the dirt white boys and the DC blacks and every gang you can think of. The, the Crips, the Bloods, the GDs. That's what they put them at in the federal system. So it's just like everybody got a lot of time, everybody got knives, and everybody want to die, but they scared to kill themselves. So they want to make you kill them. Wow. <laughs> It, it, I'm glad you made it out. I'm glad you made it out. So let's. That's what that and that changed my life right there. I and that was it. <laughs> that, that was it. And, and let's go full circle because now you're in one of your six hair 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 store locations. You're, you're in one of the six right now. And a few years ago, you were behind a 44 foot wall. Yeah. Wow. Five years ago, I was behind the wall. Five years ago. So you created this empire in, in, within in, in five years. You said last year you, you grossed 2.2, netted over a million dollars. Yeah, and I'm beating that this year. And you're beating that this year. And you have